Our monthly civil defense discussion format has not changed, but the substance and the content is more steered towards the looming events. I would like to thank you for coming, thank our guests who I will shortly introduce. Suffice it to say that we call this meeting in drawing the electoral agenda. This is the first in a series. We're not encumbering these three guests as well as you with the entire electoral agenda. We will have similar events on elections in a similar format several times on the eve of the elections. Let me introduce and we'll proceed. Dr. Karen Kololian is a children's surgeon. Over these years and decades, uh, following the earthquake, he has done zillions of surgeries on children. He has come into contact with various strata of the population, issues, problems, whether social, whether health issues. Samuel Martiresian, we call him a publicist, a media expert, a blogger. Samuel is one of those people who are on top of information exchanges and this area, this subject and his contacts and knowledge are interesting for all of us. Hachi Kevorkian's name is known in several contexts. He's an Iranian scholar, a scholar of Iranian studies, but he's also widely known as the founder of Armakad. Armakad is trying to expose the world to our education system and bring in the world into our education system. Am I right? Yes. So let's start from here. I always lamented the fact that the word policy has two meanings in Armenian. Both meanings are very important. One is politics, the other is policy. But there's one Armenian word for both. One is this give and take of power and the games played there at and the attempts. And the other is strategies, approaches, decisions on roads that take us to politics. We would like to speak about policy rather than politics. We will have many more opportunities in the forthcoming two months to speak about politics. Let's talk today about policy, about that which often is lacking amongst us. That is, what are the laws, what are the enforcement, what are the areas that matter to us in order to have a society and enjoy a living that we really need. I have to start with perhaps anointing each one of you a monarch for the coming hour or so and start with policy. If you could each adopt a couple of policies, impose, adopt policies and make it a point that we could change a lot by such policies. On our behalf, on behalf of all of us, we may try and attempt to <coughs> introduce this into the discourse, into the debate of the coming months. Good afternoon, Khachik. Let's start with you. Feel free. Well, quite naturally, I want to thank you for the invitation. You mentioned that we will spend two months talking on something that I may propose here, then we may launch it into the political agenda, into the party turnaround. Let me remind you that for over a year we've been talking exactly about that. Apparently all political parties have started talking about that single most important thing, if you want my opinion, and I'm referring to science and research. Quite naturally, if I ever were to have the power to impose things, my first step would be to enact a package of laws on science, on increasing funding for science, uh, improving the reputation that science and research are enjoying. That's in a nutshell. And I'm eagerly awaiting to see what the politicians will say in their platforms about this, whether science is at all present in their 
campaigns uh, platforms and if at all will it be like it was during the last five years when they just proclaimed it but did nothing one should say that Armakat, whether on facebook or elsewhere is trying to extract from each party and demand that they publish their position on this. Apart from Armakat, we are also we also have this initiative to increase the funding for science. Yes, we demand this, but unfortunately the closer the elections get, the politicians speak less, uh, increasingly less on science. So we will try to appeal the, to them, to the politicians, and try to clarify their position. Getting back to this subject, that which you just mentioned is what we all want, but what is the policy to get us there? It may have a different substance. So let's get back to this, Karen. Could we pick up with your experience? I couldn't be further apart from politics, or policy for that matter. My occupation does not even allow me the time to even get interested in it. Well, you're not aware of politics, but policy. Well, there are many things that in our health sector need improvement because the heritage that we, the legacy that we got from the Soviet Union, which unfortunately is still in place uh, identically as it was before, it prevents us, it prevents our country, which has very little financial capacity to take proper care and to provide high quality medical care for its population which is why first and foremost when it comes to policies our health system must have its strategy and its clearly defined program what is the development path that we want to take is it going to be a public health system like in France or should it be a private system like it's in the United States or should it be more of an insurance type of an arrangement? Getting back to this same issue, I could say that until now not a single hospital that we used to have under the Soviets ever shut down. They're all alive and running. The country does not need these many hospitals to begin with. We could have a lesser quantity there of better funding and thus offer uh, higher class medical services to the population. What matters most here is that these services have to be available to the entire population. We'll be getting back to it because to get there, we have to go through the policy issues, some well, the media world and discussions like this, the absence thereof in our blogosphere, what can you say about it? I will not only talk about media, since you crowned me king, I will talk of many other issues as well. Having seen the most recent uh, lists of candidates, it would the king's job will be quite a difficult. It was much easier to make those projections a week ago. The first thing and the most difficult thing for the authorities, for the government, well, there are three things. The first is improving the legislative framework. The most difficult thing for every government is to assure the independence of the judiciary. It's like cutting off your own flesh. You make something independent that may fire back on you. But without an independent judiciary, perhaps nothing would work out in improving our equity before the law as one of the pillars and fundamental principles. The second step would be in economics, and it's a vast area, and so I'll only say generalities, but it's obvious that in Armenia we're experiencing the worst type of capitalism here. The world has suffered it a while ago and had overcome this, in certain countries at least. Unfortunately, we are going through the most horrendous, egotistic, inhuman development path of capitalism. I don't want to sound like a commie, but 
the rudiments of socialism are being eradicated increasingly and that's only good for a very limited number of individuals and the third recipe that would not arrive in rapid changes but you can do without it is education unfortunately we talk a lot about the children being our future the education being instrumental that's just shaking the air in reality we have to realize very well that the situation one of the important reasons and causes of the current situation is that processes in the society are mostly led by individuals who have either been raised in the totalitarian Soviet educational system or are just random the products of random free-for-all Wild West type of uh, educational system of the 90s which was uh, an educational system with a big minus sign until such time as the educational system is liberalized de-Sovietized until such time as those reforms cease to be top-down rather than bottom-up until such time as education and upbringing is infested with competition between schools and the social standing of a teacher should get a little over uh, that of an ami amoeba because the lowest social status is that of the teachers. No, it's the scientists. No big difference between those two. The scientists, at least there is a certain reverence uh, for scientists. The scientists are in the most negligible situation. Uh, dear people, if we are going to become tolerant or democratic, we have to listen to each other. Well, I have used to be a scientist and I teach at school so I can make comparisons. It's more lamentable for me the plight of the teacher and the attitude towards teachers. I have worn both hats, I understand it, so don't uh, think that I'm opposing your point of view, but it's more important for me to... Uh, 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 tad, I assign a tad more importance to the upbringing of our kids, because that's where science will come from. If the Weltanschauung of a child is to get a decent car and the type of cell phone is its horizon, ten years down the road, if he's even paid well, he won't make a good scientist. That's it. Do you want to complete your... That's what was about it. So if we change that, that would be nice. Thank you, Your Majesty. If we try to look at this issue from a different angle, because all of three of you said the same thing from Samuel called it de-Sovietization and liberalization, Khachik and Karen did not use those terms, but they were hitting the same nail. Not really. The science under the Soviets and the attitude towards the Soviets, had we had the same attitude nowadays, it would have been much better. The attitude towards the science, we would like to Sovietize the attitude towards science rather than the opposite. The attitude towards uh, science, had it been Soviet, do you, don't you paint it black and white? There was support funding, and it's not here, but that doesn't mean that the only alternative to the situation is Sovietization. If, after all, we, all of us, want to take the same direction that you mentioned, should we assume that the, that the pie is limited? Do we have to choose between the teacher and the scientist? If we want to draft a policy, that means we expect certain steps to be taken to make health, public health, accessible and of adequate quality, to have education accessible and of adequate quality, and for science to be effective and of adequate quality. Am I right? What should the scientists do to improve the system for them to de-Sovietize it? And what is it that the government has to do and what is it that the private sector has to do for that? In Armenia we have some deficient approaches towards science and scientists and scholars. De-Sovietization, of course we have to shed this Soviet yoke on humanitarian science on sociology. The situation is disgraceful in social sciences. We have a handful of internationally renowned social scientists. Every scientist in his or her work should be ready for not being 
paid for or having a salary, but if they want to become a scientist, their yardstick should not be of the scale of their village or their own school, but they should aim at international criteria, which are commonly known, uh, you need just to be a little bit more informed. Unfortunately, this doesn't apply to Armenia. Our scientists should have good command of the criteria in their research area. And the government owes it to them, is responsible, and should fund and support science, because that's the foundation of everything. The question you're asking given the limited funding what needs to be done. Of course, the funds are limited and we need to use them much better. They are so limited that even uh, given the best use you cannot attain any results. That's virtually impossible. So you're referring to the current appropriations, the limited funding. What we have now, when they claim it cannot be increased, that's a flagrant lie. There are several areas where in our Facebook initiative have been identified some target areas and sources where from the funding could be obtained and increased. I should also say that the audience here may know, if they don't they should, that from the national security perspective, science at least should get 1% of the GDP. If it gets below 1% of the GDP, science and uh, scholars are facing a disaster, which means the country would be facing a disaster. In the Republic of Armenia, the funding of science is 0 0.24 hundredths of the GDP. We're competing with Senegal, Kyrgyzstan, and Somalia. But you should open the brackets. It's clear for me why health matters for all of us. Why should we give 1% of our 100 to scientists? If I'm not a scholar, if I don't take, if I don't have any direct benefits, I'm not certain. You have to explain the link and the correlation. The existence itself of scientists is a national value. The scientists create the intellectual potential. The scientists create new knowledge. The scientists add momentum to education. Without the existence of scientists, and we're gradually losing and eroding it, you cannot even have agriculture to speak of. And then what matters most? Our state is now proclaimed to be a knowledge-based economy, century or whatever. It's even more offensive for our scientists when they have zero attention and at the same time the country is proclaimed to be going through a knowledge-based economy. Rather, had it been proclaimed to be an agriculture-based period, why do they manipulate the importance of science if they do nothing? Of course, there is an understanding that science is an important sector, but they are not any real steps taken to that end. Karen and Samuel, why do we have people who care, who organize themselves and are trying to do something for change, whereas in such a basic area, which directly is important for all of us, like health and education, we don't have this professional grassroots or whatever other groups that would say this is our life, our family, our country, without this minimum minimal conditions for education or science. Why don't we have this outburst, this expectations, this discourse? Well, I think one of the first reasons is that this is a small country. For example, if I want to create an association of children's surgeons, it will be just a handful, like a dozen, and our voice won't be heard. But I have a child. I should. It should be in my best interest to have that work out. I agree with you, but such grassroots organizations, since we have no proper legislation, the creation of these uh, I mean, once created, they will remain on paper. They will, do not have real muscle. There are no laws that would allow them to operate, especially in health, the legislation is very weak. Neither the patients nor the doctors are protected. We do not have insurance for doctors for malpractice. Uh, 
if the patients complain the doctors have no defense which exists throughout the world I would like to get back to what you just said how could we develop collecting more money or using what we have better I think both are the proper ways to do it even in the United States the most the richest of hospitals still call for donations for particular projects or development areas so we need that as well we need to do fundraising apply to all sorts of funds to move ahead with particular projects but I think we could use the existing funding more effectively as well that which the country disposes of the, the appropriations that the government makes for treating our patients could be put to better use so that the patient does not do a hospital crawl and the state pays in all three of those hospitals for the same treatment. Often the government pays for things that are redundant and not necessary. It's not necessary for the government to take care of certain things that it does. So if the environmentalists can get out into the streets, tell us we need fresh air and a little greenery, why not the other areas? Let's put environment aside it's uh, an extreme case I wouldn't say so but still what I mean it's not uh, an occupation not a profession it's just an outburst of the people whereas in science had it not been for Mr. Ishkhanyan or for Khachik this would never have been brought to our attention people who just are dedicated spade day and night and push for it move this bulldozer ahead to get somewhere Everybody knows it would be nice if this or that were to happen, but there are some areas that there are some areas that would not develop until such time as there are unions. For example, it gets us back to well, we do have on paper some unions. I was walking by a building and they were attaching a plaque, something Armenian unions, blah blah blah, whatever. But there are some areas where. You can only change things pushing upwards from grassroots. Education is one of the most sophisticated and complex areas. Until such time, until this time, the society has not yet decided, oriented itself where it wants to go. In many other places, there is this internal accord between bad teachers and no good parents. The parents consider it's good that they dump off their kids in the school, pay a certain monthly fee, the headmaster takes the cash. On March 8, I will not refer to Pushkin because I do not want to... They present them with a gold bust of Pushkin or whoever. On February 23, they give another status, 24 pairs of socks to the deputy headmaster because he's male, February 23. This system works and stopping it is very difficult. The perception of the parents uh, about what education should be, and it's uh, the parents to push for this to some extent, there are some weird perceptions, precepts. Mostly they're oriented towards enrollment with universities. That's This means that the first eight years they just while away the time, those kids, and the last two years they get private tutors and mentors, put the kids under great pressure. They learn, they get a crash course on Armenian history, which they hate through, their, through the rest of their lives because they just learn some dates for that test, nothing to do with Armenian history, and they are raised as people who do not want to hear anything throughout the rest of their lives about their mean history. That's just a test for them. What, why is this done? Because there is no policy or because the policy is not applied or enforced? Well, it's the way things are and it's very difficult to override this system. It's a mechanism that turns out these kids reproducing itself year after year. Some parents remove their kids and take them to private schools at least two change something <laughs> there's a problem with private schools as well because some of them are just transforming into stark businesses the government thankfully has introduced uh, some reforms here they're now doing per per student funding of schools so there's certain competition between the schools but unfortunately it's a half measure if it's the per student funding, this also means that the state considers that the parent is a taxpayer, they pay for education, therefore they 
state this money back to the kid, but why are private schools left out of this system? In reality, it doesn't matter where the kid is learning. The parents are still a taxpayer. So there is no competition here because the private schools take up a very narrow segment. But that's a tertiary sort of issue. What you said at the beginning is what we need from our education, what type of uh, citizen do we want to be raised, and what's the purpose for my neighbor to be a decent guy or for him to enroll with the university. This brings us back to policies. Karen, in your area, the policy has been transformed in the recent years. A child under seven years of age should be treated free of charge, regardless of whose kid that is. So there's no policy issue here. There is a policy issue here. What makes an eight-year-old child different from a seven-year-old child to begin with? They're taller. There is no difference. So if it's a policy that there should be a line drawn, it should be at least all children. And secondly, the funding that the government appropriates for this in a country where the prices are very high for everything. If you're ready and willing to treat that kid, to offer him proper, adequate treatment the way it, he would have received in Europe or in the States, that funding is not sufficient for this. A simple example to illustrate. A spinal cord surgery with implants. Just the cost of those implants is about 3,000 US. And you cannot use implants that are manufactured are in an artisanal way. You have to buy them at the proper source. And quite naturally, the state that pays $700 for the entire treatment of such a patient in children's orthopedics, which includes the wages, the utility bills, the janitor, you can't do that surgery. You're ready and willing to do it. You can do it. That's the biggest lament of ours, which is why we, for such projects and programs, we do fundraising uh, from the outside to assure such treatment for our kids. Could we say that there exists a policy, it, is, it just needs to be honed further? So your colleague, uh, could we have a colleague of yours disagreeing with what you just said? Is the policy agreed upon? Another surgeon could disagree. Not, not a surgeon. Another, a simple pediatrician who is not in such a situation. Is there a policy? Is it right? If we take pediatrics, the state is appropriating big amounts for pediatric care for kids to be treated in hospital. Throughout the rest of the world, if you go to children's hospitals, they do not have the children's hospital or children's wing. All of these kids get outpatient treatment. And for the state, it's much more beneficial, it's cheaper, it, you take less hospital treatment, it's very expensive. Uh, in the United States, just a bed in a hospital without treatment is between 900 and 1500 dollars. Just taking up a bed in a hospital, not to mention treatment. Whereas if you go to our children's hospitals, you will see that all wings are full and it's healthy kids running around. These are kids that could have been treated out in an outpatient regime. It would be more beneficial for the kid, for the state, for the parent. And the funding that the state gives to this could have been used for those who come for surgeries or who are in ICU, something you can do as an inpa uh, outpatient. Uh, a brief summary before we do a Q&A. Is science more of a funding issue rather than a policy or strategy issue or deciding on priorities? Education, as far as we first need to understand what is it that we want, who is it that we want from, is it from the private or public sector, the teacher or the, teacher or the parent? One more thing I would like to add on education. Just educating them is not sufficient. After we educate them, we need to create conditions for these well-educated kids to stay in the country, to keep them here. That's very important. Those young people who do want to acquire good education, they will always find a way. Very often they educate themselves abroad. And very often they do not return because they do not see a future here. So apart from educating them, we should create an environment, conditions for these young people to stay. I'm certain that in order to progress, first and foremost, we need education, yes.
Please, the floor is open, Mr. Rishkhania. I have two comments. One is addressed to what Mr. Marty Rosian said. Education is not limited just to schooling. Education, university education is no less important for development in any area when it's specialists. University education is impossible without high class science. This is axiomatic. And this leads me to your question, Madam Salbi, as to why people who have nothing to do directly with science still support it. First and foremost, just to have decent education. You cannot have decent, uh, adequate education without high-class science, which feeds the faculty. Throughout the world, university education is built around research, and a symbiotic relationship between education and science. Secondly, second is the security consideration. The country, the country's perimeter is protected by its troops. And the future of the country depends uh, whether this country will survive in this most complex geopolitical, not only provided it is competitive, and creates a proper foundation. That includes the military foundations. And the military industry is impossible without science. Everyone should understand that his or her personal security is at stake. And the science will, the absence of science will fire back on your own security. And you may have chances of being slaughtered in the next genocide, which is why you should care about science, about its existence and development. Thank you. Would you like to reflect on that? Briefly, the opposite could also be stated. For example, there are countries that have the military industry as a feeding factor for the uh, science. It may work the other way as well. We're in a situation where the army could become one of the incentives, uh, the push factors for development of science. Armin Akchatinyan, a journalist, you talked about science and described the importance there too. I would like to ask the question, why should we take funding away from the teachers and give it to our scientists? If you add the proportion within the GDP, you have to save elsewhere. So the question is, do you know what the average age of our scientists is? What's the efficiency rate of their output? As a scientist, I ask you, why, do, no, why, do, why don't we have people who would invent Skype or people of the caliber of Rubin? And people become professors or academicians just to get a waiver from conscription. That's a fundamentally wrong approach. When you talk about adding the proportion, increasing the proportion vis-à-vis uh, -vis the GDP, of course, we do not assume that it should be taken away from other segments. Let's assume there is economic growth. Have there been periods when we had economic growth, when they catch people who evade taxes, you get more funding, but the funding for science never increases. Uh, let me reflect on your other question now. Why would we add funding for science? Because the efficiency of our scholars is low. Let's look at international criteria and reports of international organizations. According to UNESCO, 2010-11 report, Armenian science is a pretty competitive globally, especially the exact sciences, I assure you. Let's leave social sciences aside. In natural sciences, almost every Armenian scientist is as efficient, uh, as, efficient as anyone else in the world. If we look at the number of scientists per capita and their output in natural exact scientists, it's up to the best international standards, the first 10 rankings in the world. Do you 
job of the fundamental and social scientists, 90% of it is just to publish something, to be published internationally in a peer-reviewed. It's the only uh, way to gauge scientists. We have about five to 6,000 scientists. All of them together have published in 540 peer-reviewed international magazines. Half of it is phys physicists, 30% is biologists, social scientists are about like 3 to 4%. We used to have competitive science. The average age of scientists is 58 now. Very soon, we, once, if within the next five years they do not get unprecedented infusions, these people will retire. Uh, we do not have a middle generation of Armenian scientists. Therefore, we do need to fund them. We should not shrink the funding. Often they say they're bad scientists, they shouldn't work. We should keep them all alive. We should increase the funding to the extent of those who exist but don't work for them to catch up with the best international standards, open up the segment for the new generation to aspire to... Picking up with that question, iPhone and all other high-tech the seed money came, especially in the United States, from the government. So that which we did not reflect on, the PPP in science. The link with the private sector is absent. One more thing, the Republic of Armenia in reality needs to give 3% of GDP to science. 1% should be provided by the government, the rest by the private sector. Yes, we do not have the proper attitude towards science, we do not have a decent attitude towards science. The private sector does not perceive that science may come in handy for them, because it's easier for them to buy and import stuff from abroad. This doesn't ask for a scientific attitude. Our business people do not have the proper mindset for Skype and iPhone, although we do have some business people who do invest in IT and have invested in IT. I hope it will be okay 100 years down the road. Thank you. Ruben Melkonian, scholar of Turkish studies. My question is addressed to Khachik, since we both are from the area of Oriental studies. I think Khachik is elevating the degree of our scholars published in international peer reviewed journals to a fetish degree. So a person who is published in Iran and Caucasus magazine is a high class scholar, whereas the historian who is published in the Journal of Yerevan State University, in your terminology, is a substandard scholar. I think that's too black and white and not right. And another question. I think the information that you quoted about social scientists being published insufficiently in international peer-reviewed journals is because there's, they're more politicized. You can quietly, simply and easily publish things about physics or biology. So my question is, are you certain that an Armenian scholar who would write something on Turkey or Iran or Arab countries, if he submits, makes a submission to the international journals, would he be perceived as easily published as physicists or biologists? And the second question, if you're so open and frank, let's take it all the way and tell us, please, out of internationally renowned scientists, who work in Armenia today preach and promote monopolies or not? Let me spell it out. Editors or board members, editorial board members of internationally renowned magazines today contribute to their own disciplines in Armenia, raising new scientists that would then be published in the same journals, or do they publish themselves, publish their relatives' articles, and that was, uh, that was a deep context. 
Let me respond to the first question. I'm certain that if this were to be a normal academic up to standard text or submission in social sciences, there is absolutely no difference where the submission comes from. No one has ever used this excuse that the social scientists refer to. Uh, I'm not speaking about myself. All social scholars revert to this excuse. We're Armenians. Will they allow us to publish an article on genocide? I didn't refer to genocide. Well, I'm just bringing it as an example. I could even illustrate this with an example. The Armenian economists. There are a hundred PhDs defended on in economics. I still insist we do not have a decent economist. One out of a thousand is decent. Did any one of them know that econometrics gave Aron Ajemoglu of Armenian origin, who works now at the MIT? Did any economist in Armenia ever think of making a submission to econometrics? No. And the editor was Armenian. Do historians in Armenia, any one of them, some do, but did most of them ever think of looking at what periodicals exist in the world on the history or make any submissions? Very few have ever written or submitted. Most of those few who submitted got published. No one is attempting. That's why you don't get it. You should try. And you'll see that they will publish it if it's adequate, and our rating will increase. The second question is, I agree. I think that there's a problem. We have a, uh, just one internationally reputable publication in Armenia on Iranian studies, and it's lamentable that there are very few people published there from Armenia. I assure you that I'm working on it personally, God willing, very soon. The, we, our School of Oriental Studies will have more publications in Iran and Caucasus or other Oriental Study journals. And your first comment that I'm elevating this to a fetishism. Yes, I do. I will always make those noises, even if I may err sometimes and raise my voice. But this will at least stir those who should respond. And it's not necessarily black and white. You can publish both in Le Raberge, local one, and the Journal of Oriental Studies. Also, for other questions, all these questions start with an if. I would like to ask the question: Do we have in this country a national security strategy that is well prioritized? Does it prioritize science, if at all, or those disciplines that are pertinent in the context of national security, national progress, and national competitiveness? Spontaneous development is taken for granted. In science, every scientist finds a way and develops on his or her own. Will we, after all, by the end of the day, have identified priorities for development of science? Who was this addressed to? And another question, what needs to be done, Mr. Koloyan? You raised the issue of the brain drain of the young scholars. I consider this is also an issue of national security. We're losing the brains that could have been put to better use. What needs to be done to prevent it? Until this day, there have been several policies elaborated and adopted in this country on science. Unfortunately, I have not seen, Mr. Ishkanyan will correct me if I'm wrong, whether there was any emphasis apart from Armenian studies or any other discipline that would be considered important for this country. That's one of our big losses. The Republic of Armenia until this day has not specified or spelled out which discipline exactly or disciplines are that we need most. I have my own perception of this which I'll keep to myself so far, but I think the state, the government, has to do this, clarify exactly which areas of research 
merit most attention in this country. Apart from Armenian studies, there is a concept, conceptual framework for development of Armenian studies. It's been adopted, but there are no real outputs, outcomes. Nothing moves ahead. The conceptual framework, the policy is rather on what we want and why, but not the how. The how is there. The how is also there in that strategy. Yes. All, we, all that needs is to take and do it. As for keeping young brains in Armenia, the first thing should be healthy competition. Whether it's the medical university and the enrollment there too. It's not those who can pay that need to be enrolled, but those who studied well in school, like it's done elsewhere in the world. Upon graduation, if they become residents, there need to be a competition. <laughs> I'm taking on board residents for many years, but I don't choose them. I have no right to select. They only send to us those who pay for it. Had there been a proper competition, the same should apply to uh, employment. That's first. And the second thing is I think that the government should devise policies and projects and policies to keep these kids in the country. They should give them scholarships for study abroad and uh, demand that they... So King Samuel wants to have an education system in place that they would be in a position to pass through that competition while they get. You can't keep the kids in the con in country just by a good education system. This new uh, generation is very independent. You just have to let them, allow them to do things they want. In reality, when we say that Apple was invented in the garage, in the United States there is this thing. Two guys in their garage could launch a startup business. You can do it here. And that keeps the kids away and it pushes them out. They don't find the ways to... St I'm not only talking about startup businesses. There are many areas where just the entry barriers are too high. Is it possible for several young, not fresh graduates, but like middle-aged guys to <coughs> set up a hospital? Yes, it is possible, but they won't be able to run it. Well, there are many layers to this. So, even if there are good professionals, they still won't be able. I was thinking about uh, setting up a hospital for children, orthopedic surgery. Who's going to pay for the treatment? The under the law, the state should not pay the private hospitals, but they do, of course. But to select few private hospitals, we do not have an insurance system in place yet. It's in the making in the pipeline, but it doesn't work yet. The parents of the patients cannot pay the realistic costs for such a hospital to operate, and there are many other issues that you cannot disclose here. You're an insider, but there are more important issues. We'll understand that. I address the question both to Samvel and Mr. Koloyan. What's the solution? How do you see it in this current medical health system? After all, everything is put in place to serve the nation rather than go against its interests. So what's your suggestion? A fundamental recommendation. And the second question for Samvel. How justified it is to have a 12-year-old long uh, school system? from elementary to high school. So what are the fundamental recommendations that you would propose? Thank you. I would say that the first thing that needs to be done is a radical decrease in the number of hospitals and doctors. There should be healthy competition between doctors, professionals, specialized. I'm talking of children's orthopedic surgery because I am aware of it. We have more than 30 children's orthopedic surgeons, whereas the country only needs three or four. But they all make a living, they all work, they all earn. Most of them do more harm than good to the patients. So first and foremost we need that. Secondly, the government should clearly decide on what is it that it's paying for. The patients come for an exam, then they put into the hospital and the government pays for this hospital. If the examination funding is five to 10,000 drums, it's what many patients can afford themselves. And 
the government is, does not pay five to ten thousand. If you put person up in a hospital, it's the wages of the doctor, it's the utility bills, it's it's much more spending. This funds could have been used more effectively. And the third and most important thing, the government should clearly know who is it paying. Is it public hospitals or is it private hospitals? I think that the government should not pay private hospitals. If it's private, then it's private. They should make a living. To be fair, I have to say that in the United States and in the UK, the same questions are being asked every year. The question here is elevated to a more global scale. What and how should the government pay and to what extent is the health system ready and willing and mature to effectively save my life? Well, in order to get there, we need to cut down on the quantities first. We have four or five children's hospitals in Yerevan, whereas one would be sufficient for Armenia. As for those 12 years of schooling, I know that parents don't take it well, but there are two important factors here. The first is mostly ignored by those parents who are concerned about their kids' education, and this concern has some negative uh, ramifications. The parents steer their kids towards enrollment in a particular university. My many years of contacts with the kids come to prove that at 16 years of age only 10% of the kids know what they want or where they want to enroll. Since they haven't made up their minds, most of them go to where their parents steer them. So when you finish school at 18, it's much better. You have, the kids are better oriented, if you want my opinion. Secondly, it will allow us to unburden the curriculum. I have made many surveys of the record of headmasters. They all agree unambiguously that after fifth or sixth grade only about 10% of kids perceive what they're being taught because it's a great pressure. Chemistry, there's no such discipline. The kids don't know what chemistry is except for those who uh, explode things in their backyards. <laughs> they learn hands-on. Only those kids who need to enroll in relevant, like uh, medical school or whatever, they know it. For others, it's some sort of an occult met metaphysical science. When they finish school at 18, at least they get some leeway to perceive what they want. So now it's even worse because history was from the 5th to the 10th grade and the kid at least made it to make a distinction between Napoleon and Jean d'Arc, except for gender, of course. Whereas now, it's all of history between 6th and ninth grades, and from 10th grade they start from Stone Age again, because it's, uh, it's Armenian history uh, in the context of world history, and the kids start from scratch again. This means that they never make it past 19th century. No kid never ever makes it. Even the teacher cannot squeeze it all into a single curriculum and the kids are not able to follow up and understand what's it all about. What is this? What makes these people and dates that succeed each other in rows? The, but there's an issue. At least if you spread it out over 12 years, it's doable. I think the only solution is to liberalize the whole area to allow competition to settle in. Initially it may be chaotic, but the kids and the parents will very quickly find and identify the schools that are better. The bad ones will just perish. There's no other way. No one could invent another way of... Look at the textbook. Textbooks. It's a Kafkaesque uh, experience, this textbooks. Every new textbook is another nightmare. There's algebra for seventh grade, depressive exercises all over. For example, it says every year the population decreases in the town by a certain percentage. Make an estimation how many people will... If a person is a criminal, his fingerprints are somewhere... I mean, all of the exercises... A kid over the years was reduced to schizophrenic and oriented towards... Everything was crumbling, falling down, dilapidating in the algebra textbook. So they're just moonlighting. It's laws. That's the absence of a policy. They write up those textbooks ASAP, 
under those loan projects. Look at those. Just take those textbooks and have a look. In geography, in the fifth grade, do you have geology? Do you have to explain to them what rain is? I read it. I didn't understand what precipitation was. Or should you teach a uh, eighth grade kid that there is just one zero in the eighth grade? At this good cue and the call for liberalization. Uh, with this call for liberalization, let's conclude the meeting. If we're talking policies, we're talking education, we're talking uh, economics, health and science. But all three brought us back to economics. Or education? No, science. Science is the epitome. Okay, thank you very much. We'll see you and talk about the same. And now you are invited to a cup of coffee.